China's space mission is bang on target with a safe return of its manned spacecraft after a record 90 days in space and a new cargo craft going up with fresh supplies. So what's next for the China space program and how are the other space powers going to regard China's success? In a following exclusive interview, renowned American historian, author, and documentary maker Peter Kuznick talks about how the U.S. has kept the flames of wars alive around the world despite the lessons of World War II. Welcome to The Point, an opinion show coming to you live from Beijing. I'm Li Yuan, sitting in for Liu Xin. Now, China's space odyssey has moved closer to the goal with its manned spacecraft safely returning to Earth on Friday, September 17th, after the three crew members spent a record 90 days in space. Now, three days later, China launched Tianzhou-3, a cargo spacecraft carrying supplies. The countdown has started to the Chinese space station Tiangong, which means the Heavenly Palace, to be up and operational next year, marking a milestone in global space activities. President Xi Jinping has said the space is an important strategic asset that must be well managed and protected. So, what are the next steps, and how far has China come since the start in the 1950s? And what are the challenges out there? To throw light on this, we have Professor Yang Yuguang from China Aerospace Science and Industry Corp in Beijing, and also joining us from Memphis, Professor Joseph Mahoney of East China Normal University. Great to have both of you with us. So let me start with Professor Yang first. After the manned spacecraft Shenzhou 12 landed safely back in the Gobi Desert with its three crew members, a cargo spacecraft, Tianzhou 3, was launched on September 20th with supplies. You and I covered that. And so the stage is all set for sending up another manned spacecraft to possibly stay even longer in space, six months. Could you please tell us more about the next mission? What are the major tasks? What's its role in preparing the stage for the Tiangong Space Station? Well, you know that the Shenzhou 13 mission and the 13, uh, Shenzhou 12 mission are very, very important for China's uh, space station program because we have to uh, demonstrate and verify the new technologies we haven't tested before. For instance, the Shenzhou 12 mission has the first uh, long-term residence in space for three months, and this time the Shenzhou 13 mission will stay there for six months. So it is uh, uh, equivalent to the future uh, terms of each expedition team in space. So it is very necessary for us to test that first for the long-term residents to verify the technology needed to uh, deal with the problems made by the long-term residents of the astronaut in space to counter measure of the uh, microgravity environment and also to test our uh, uh, regenerative life support system. So this time you see that the uh, Tianzhou 3 has brought all the resupplies for the uh, three crew member to stay in space for half a, uh, for half a year, uh, which is very necessary. We can still remember that because of the delay of the Tianzhou 2 mission, so the Shenzhou 12 is also delayed. Uh, you can see how important it is for our Shenzhou 13 mission. And Professor Yang, just talk to us a bit more about our space station up there. It is scheduled to be completed by the year 2022. Is everything going according to schedule as of now? And what will be its main functions after it's completed? At the current stage, the uh, whole plan goes very smoothly. So next month, uh, in October, we will launch our Shenzhou 13, and uh, the three crew, uh, maybe including one uh, female astronaut, will stay there for half a year. And after that, we will have a very strict uh, evaluation of the Tianhe experimental uh, core module and uh, verify if everything, every configuration, every design is correct. And then uh, only after that, we can begin the formal construction of the station and launch the uh, Wentian module and the Mengtian module into space. Please notice that we have three bedrooms in the uh, uh, core module, so we can only have uh, three astronauts in space simultaneously. So after the Wentian is coming into orbit, we can have the uh, expedition uh, teams uh, in orbit delivery of their tasks. Three bedrooms, space station, not so bad. But Professor Mahoney, let me bring you into this. Let's talk about the International Space Station, uh, in which the United States has a leading role. That is expected to retire in 2024. After 26 years of being the only space station, do you think that it will retire? Are there any indications that it will be replaced? You know, I haven't seen any indications yet. I think the United States is in a position where it's looking to rethink uh, its international partnerships, uh, especially with Russia. Uh, and we know that Russia now is, is uh, talking more openly with China and that the United States is thinking about uh, working more with commercial uh, partners uh, to look towards moving towards the moon. 
uh, as well as Mars, but they will need a platform uh, if uh, probably on the moon as well as a space station in order to make those jumps to Mars. So um, whether or not what we currently have will be rehabbed in some way or whether something else uh, new will go up remains to be seen. Hmm. And Professor Mahoney, you know, China has said it is willing to work with any space institution that works for peaceful use of space, but foreign astronauts would be welcome to work in Tiangong. Uh, but NASA Administrator Bill Nelson caught China, quote, a very aggressive competitor and said that, unfortunately, I believe we are in space race with China. That's his words. Uh, how do you look at the different positions? You know, this really started in 2011 when the United States uh, put in place a law preventing, uh, uh, legally preventing uh, NASA from having any sort of constructive relationship with China. It was really the U.S. freezing China out of international space exploration. Uh, the U.S. is the heavyweight in that field uh, globally. And it, it's, it's what pushed China to, to go it alone. Uh, and now the U.S. Is, is reframing this as China instigating a space race. It's really, it's really quite absurd. Professor Yang, your thoughts on this? Well, you know, that's, uh, we just bring the, see the fact that even after the uh, China space station has been built, the total mass of the station is only about uh, not, less, not greater than seven, uh, seven, uh, 70 tons. And because, you know, that this station is extendable, in the future it is possible to have a second uh, core module and other experimental modules. So only after it is extended, the total combination cannot be greater than 180 tons. So this mass is less than half of the International Space Station. How can this be defined as a competition? So we try to only develop this, this kind of manned space program according to our own needs to promote our high te technology and benefit the national economy and also the, our daily life, not compete with other countries. If they think so, they just do it, but we don't compete with them. Well, today is Mid-Autumn Festival in China, and the festival is celebrating a full moon. Professor Yang, the moon has a very important place in space explorations. And last December, Chang'e 5, named after the Chinese moon goddess, brought back rock and soil samples from the surface of the moon. And the last time this was done was 44 years ago. And there are also reports that China and Russia jointly plan to build an international lunar station. I mean, what are China's next moon plans? You know that uh, China and Russia has this uh, joint robotic uh, scientific research uh, lunar base on the on, on the lunar surface. But the, on the first steps, uh, they are only a robotic one, not manned. So in the future, although the central government of China has not uh, formally approved this plan, but the leaders of China Aerospace has already expressed their wish to have uh, human missions to the moon, or even in the future, a uh, lunar base on the lunar surface. But we have already have some uh, technology preparations, for instance, uh, we are now developing the 500 ton level large uh, thrust uh, rocket engines. And also, the new generation uh, spaceship has been tested last year. It is potential to be the cool transportation uh, vehicle for the future potential uh, moon mission. But a sustainable uh, moon uh, mission is very important for us to uh, learn from the lessons of the Apollo program to have a, a continuous residence on the lunar surface. So reducing, reducing the cost is very important for Earth. So a crude moon landing is possible. How soon can we expect that, Professor Yang? Maybe within 10 years, I believe, uh, from my from own personal view. 10 years, OK. Now, NASA has plans to return astronauts to the moon's surface as well by 2024 with this Artemis mission, also a name of the moon. Professor Mahoney, the last NASA crewed landing was in 1972. What's the reason for this late return? Well, you know, it's, it's marvelous after uh, that, that the U.S. is returning uh, and, and becoming more active in space. After, uh, after really seeing uh, its space exploration uh, decline uh, after the end of the, um, the shuttle um, program. Um, but, uh, you know, a lot of people see this as a response to uh, Chinese space exploration. And, uh, and again, the U.S. sort of uh, instigating uh, a new type of Cold War or space race um, as, it, as it had with the Soviet Union. Um, and, you know, it's, it's also marvelous that the U.S. is telling us now, uh, you know, uh, ahead of a, a possible Artemis landing uh, on, on the lunar surface in, in 2024, that, uh, that, the, that there will be a, a woman and a person of color uh, 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 stepping on the moon. Um, but, and, and I guess this is a form of, of uh, progress 
uh, but it's also pandering to identity politics in a uh, racially uh, fractured, polarized nation, one in which you know, there's already significant inequality between men and women uh, before the pandemic and something has gotten much worse. So in a way, uh, I think we have sort of a uh, uh, symbolic uh, progress in the absence or symbolic social justice in the absence of a real one. But uh, you know, if, uh, as long as these can be uh, real human steps forward and not just the U.S. trying to establish some sort of hegemonic position in space, then it's good for all of us. And Professor Mahoney, I do want to talk about the prospects of um, commercial space travels. I mean, it's space becoming the next hotbed of commercial activities. I mean, last week, U.S. billionaire Elon Musk's SpaceX company sent four people on their space ride, the first case of space tourism. And Elon Musk announced a 50 million U.S. dollar donation as well to a charity. And the trip is also set to be a fundraiser. But at a time when we are talking about global warming and fighting pollution, what could be the impact of such activities if they become frequent? Well, you know, there are two points here. The first is that private companies have always played major roles in U.S. space development. Um, and, you know, the difference with, with SpaceX, uh, uh, um, Musk's firm, and, and Bezos' Blue Origins mm -hmm. is that they, were, they didn't start off uh, as military or avionic-affiliated firms that adjusted to new opportunities uh, emerging after World War II. Rather, these are companies that had built themselves uh, as independent uh, 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 space-oriented uh, uh, firms that also seek government contracts. Now, with uh, the Artemis project, uh, their expected contributions are surpri surprisingly small. They're, they're more engaged in other activities. Um, uh, and, and, uh, but uh, I think with the, um, uh, with the space tourism, uh, and, and especially with this civilian thing that we saw, this all-civilian crew that we saw with uh, SpaceX, uh, it's a clear demonstration of capacity and technology. Um, and uh, you know, I think if we take this in tandem with the recent flight by Branson, and Bezos, who demonstrates that the space tourism market has reached a point where it's becoming more of a reality, even though it's going to be impossibly expensive for most people, and, and clearly have a, a tremendous impact, a negative impact on the environment. But to be clear, in, in the case of SpaceX and, and, and Bezos, uh, it's, uh, excuse me, and Musk, uh, it's clear that he has a bigger vision in mind, and, and that developing these capabilities and entering this market is a step towards his desire to build a colony on Mars, uh, where uh, he may find that his closest neighbors uh, will be Chinese. Hmm. Now, both Jeff Bezos and Mass, uh, they have ties with NASA. Professor Young, SpaceX and Bezos Aerospace Company Blue Origins are among the five U.S. firms NASA has chosen for the Artemis program, and they have multi-million dollar contracts for providing inputs, including feedback on industry capabilities for crewed lunar landing missions. Do you see American companies curving up the space pie among themselves? What could be the consequences when others also venture into space? Well, you know that the U.S. has already have their launch vehicle, the SLS. Uh, it will come to launch maybe this year or next year. And also they have already developed their uh, Orion uh, space, uh, cruise spaceship. So the key point is the uh, lunar module, or that one can uh, give a transportation solution from the lunar surface to the lunar orbit. But currently speaking, I don't think their choice, the, uh, the, the Starship of SpaceX is a good choice, even if the design can be greatly modified, it is not the right one to uh, land on the lunar surface. Maybe the uh, Blue Origin has a better solution, but uh, still it's under, uh, far below the schedule. So I think in the future we still uh, uh, need to wait and see. And moreover, you see that the United States has announced that because of lacking of the, uh, the, uh, the, the, the schedule of the space suit uh, for the working on the lunar surface is far behind schedule, so maybe it is not possible for, uh, for, for, for them to land on the moon before 2024. So maybe the original goal cannot be achieved. We'll be watching. Thank you very much, Professor Yang Yuguan and Professor Joseph Mahoney, uh, for both of your insights. And let's now take a short break on The Point, and we will be back with an exclusive interview on the American wars. Making sense of the overwhelming wave of information means cutting through the noise to shine a light on the heart of the story and making room for new perspectives. True understanding means the ability to see events from more than one side. I'm Liu Xin, and this is The Point. 
Welcome back. September 21st marks International Day of Peace. It's a good time to remember the Second World War. After it ended in 1945 with about 75 million deaths, people expected peace and stability, finally. Instead, we have seen more wars as the United States seeks to impose its own political model and deals on others. Is protecting freedom and democracy the real reason, or are there darker motives? Did the lessons learned in Japan, Vietnam, Iraq, and recently in Afghanistan leave no impact at all? In an exclusive interview, eminent American historian, author, and documentary maker Peter Kuznick spoke to my colleague Liu Xin about what makes America wage war at the drop of a hat.